if we happen to have a specific mutation that causes disease to understand how is it that it eventually leads to that disorder. Even when we know this correlation, we don't understand the process. So he's the, this has huge implications for our understanding of biology and life, but also for health and disease, and it could transform everything we do. At least, that's our hope. You'll hear a bo a more about the science in a moment when I invite our panelists on stage, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank all the teams here at the Allen Institute, the CZI, and at UW that brought this Seattle Hub for Synthetic Biology to life in an efficient and record time and with lots of generosity and happiness. Um, everyone worked hard to have an agreement by December 7th when we announced it last year. And January 8th, operations started at the Seattle Hub for Synthetic Biology. So kudos for everyone and thank you. Now I'd like to invite uh, on stage Steve Quake, the head of science at CZI. Steve, welcome. <laughs> Amy Herr, vice president of the CZI Biohub Network. <laughs> Jay Shanduri, the lead scientific director of the Seattle Hub for Synthetic Biology. <laughs> and Marion Pepper, uh, co-director of the Seattle Hub for Synthetic Biology and also chair of immunology at UW. Thank you all. <laughs> Biology, what's the purpose? What, what is it that we're gonna do with this? Can you explain in terms that we could all maybe understand or get a glimpse of the work being done and what's to come. Yeah, Jay, maybe you can take this one. Happy to take this away. And I'll, I'll just start by echoing your, your thanks and, and, and saying I'm, I'm, I'm glad at least so far this does not appear to be the most elaborate April Fool's joke ever played in science. <laughs> <laughs> but I see half an hour left. Um, so, okay, so um, uh, at the highest level to explain the, the mission here, um, you know, in, in science, we're fundamentally limited by how we make measurements. Uh, and um, we would argue that the way we, we, we currently make measurements, are, measurements are, are limited in some really important ways, right? So in particular, biology, for the most part, unfolds um, in places you can't see. So for example, in the developing embryo, and also over time, right? So we can visualize things with the microscope, uh, but you can only see what you can see, and you can usually only see a few things. Um, and you can take, you know, you can take snapshots by by destroying a cell or a, or an embryo, uh, and peering at the DNA and proteins that are inside. Um, but in an ideal world, we'd be able to to make all kinds of measurements and to do it over over time within living cells and organisms. And so um, our 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 goals here are, are one. Uh, this idea of can we turn cells and organisms into their own historians? Uh, and then even more ambitiously, looking to the, the further future, um, can we program cells and organisms to autonomously uh, sense and redirect their futures, right? Um, everything I think in, that we do in science depends at some level on technology. We're, we're fundamentally limited by the tools that we have available to us. So as an example of the kind of tool we've recently built that we think makes this uh, forward-looking vision possible is, is this idea of uh, DNA typewriter. And so here, um, the analogy of a typewriter is an excellent analogy in the sense that we are literally punching symbols into the genome, into genomic DNA. And um, like a typewriter, uh, we've got a type head that is putting information at, at one position and then it moves to the next position and punches another symbol. And these symbols, um, uh, uh, in principle, and we've, we have ways to realize this in practice, can correspond to particular biological signals, right? So we can actually sense and record specific things um, to DNA. So essentially, uh, you know, a symbolic language for 
longitudinally recording biology over time and taking advantage of uh, the stability of the genome um, and its ubiquity, it's present in every cell in your body, um, to have a substrate to which to write, right? Um, and then, you know, so that's, that's one overarching principle here. Uh, the second is this notion, and this is, this is um, uh, uh, partly a, a leap of faith, but I think it's one that a lot of us share, um, that, that biology is fundamentally learnable, right? We can, we can construct models that, that um, capture all of this and, and, and can make accurate predictions. And so in addition to building these recording devices and deploying them, um, we want to essentially perturb biology at scale uh, in model organisms and, and, and model um, uh, in vitro um, models of, of human development. And um, with that scaled perturbational data um, to construct models that are then predictive, right? Um, and in terms of like, you know, what would we want to record? The, the list is, you know, is, as big as your imagination. Um, the, uh, I'm not going to list all of these out here, but the, the ones that are colored in orange are, are ones where we already have a pretty good idea of how to do it. Um, while the ones that are in blue, um, we don't really know how to do yet. And that's part of the, the, the gamble here and part of the investment is to try and realize the recording of all of these things. Um, and in the longer view, uh, be in a position not just to deploy them in um, model systems, um, but also in, in, in living humans. Um, and that's all I got, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's cool. And uh, <laughs> I'm already excited about what's to come. I, I'm I mean, also not playing an April Fool's joke on you, in yes. case you were wondering. So, <laughs> so. The, uh, I mean, we just, we just uh, visited here the facilities where the teams are working. And um, Steve, so the, the CZI has this grand mission of understanding, potentially curing, managing a lot of the diseases or chronic diseases we have by end of the century. Um, but CZI has invested a lot in foundational science transformative technologies. How do you see this initiative in the context of that large ecosystem that you're building? Yeah. So um, we believe that transformative advances in medicine are driven by discoveries in basic science. We have a hundred year time scale to think about the impact of our work. And so that has led us to focus really on trying to fund great science right now with the belief that over the next couple of decades, it'll lead to therapies and cures for disease. Our North Star is understanding the mysteries of the cell and how cells interact in systems. And that's in large part driven by sort of the observation that we're in the midst of a revolution in cell biology right now. And, you know, we kind of, uh, we were doing this 20 years ago, we'd be saying, understand the mysteries of the macromolecule, but protein structure solved, predicted, genome sequence, the molecules are relatively well understood. And what's unknown is understanding how they work together in cells to make the smallest invisible unit of life. And so many diseases uh, are, you know, due to cells being out of kilter in one way or another that, you know, focusing on that is going to give us a lot of insight into, into disease. And with all that as background, um, thinking about tools to record what cells are doing in living organisms, just, <laughs> it's inescapable. It's going to lead to great scientific discoveries over time. So this seems like a really foundational technology for things we care about and that will ultimately impact human health. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the, just the prospect of what could come is exciting for people in science. And Amy, as, as I was alluding to, um, and you were critical on, on this, this is a collaboration of scientists from different um, aspects of science, you know, from engineers, bioinformatics, molecular biologists, cell biologists, but also a collaboration between institutions, right, and funders. Um, how do you see these collaboration as potentially accelerating things in science or exponentially going exponentially faster? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, efforts like this that CZI is investing in and identifying are just absolutely critical to catalyzing that. 
not just progress towards what Steve indicated is our 100 year goal to cure, prevent and manage all disease, which seems audacious. It is, it is absolutely audacious. But I think underlining that is this point that we don't plan to do that alone. It's through efforts like this, bringing together these amazing institutions and people to be able to uh, provide new tools and technologies, new inventions, new discoveries. I think also very importantly, new generations of researchers who know how to work across disciplines and who are inspired by uh, including the two three people four people on this stage um, to tackle these problems that that might seem a bit audacious or maybe too audacious at the beginning but then you come to understand that if we work together in new ways it's possible absolutely and so marion at the level of the scientists and the scientists in each of these institutions there's also great collaboration. I mean, you two are here on stage representing, but this is a larger team. How do you see the value of those collaborations, scientific collaborations also in accelerating things? I think we each come with our own unique abilities and expertise. And I think we've learned that doing science collaboratively is way more efficient um, than each of us staying siloed in our own worlds, I think. Um, having this interesting hybrid between sort of an academic versus an industry type of model and combining those two together um, in a city that really values collaboration, I think it's just going to speed this up. And I think um, by drawing on each of our institutions uh, expertises, it's going to be a lot faster than if we tried to do this solo. It's, you know, when, when I said cool, <laughs> right, I mean, this is cool, but we just visited the the actual facilities and we had you know um, younger scientists explain what their teams are doing and i got pretty excited about <laughs> thinking what's going to be possible it's a bit i mean i don't want to make this analogy but i'm going to do it anyway <laughs> it's, it's like the, an ai moment but for biology right where you can have exponentially more ways to sense or modify cells right the synthetic biology, but um, what excites each of you personally the most about these? I mean, when we're visiting, you know, from a very spontaneous perspective, and there's no order here. Just grab the mic and and. You know, it's very exciting to me to see the technology, which is sort of a glimmer a rough proof of principle, um, just super early stage, and then to try to imagine what it can grow into. Um, and, you know, when Jay and team were first presenting us the sort of tape recorder technology and we were digging into it and it was clearly very early and, you know, kind of felt a little insane to think about putting into an animal. <laughs> it was just barely working in cell lines. And, you know, I'm just super excited by having working together and thank you, Ree, for your partnership on this, which is just awesome of course. to create a runway to really see how far this thing can go and and and, and meet what we hope is going to be its true potential. Absolutely. I mean, for, I mean, for, for I think I'll say two things, right? One, one is, um, you know, something that I think highlights, a, you know, an aspect that's really unique here, and at least I haven't seen before in, in my time here, which was having UW and Alan scientists, right? Different employers, different health plans, whatever you want to call it, right? But <laughs> physically in the same space and excited about the same science. And I think connecting to and drawing on synergies with their respective institutions. And I think it's a very powerful thing. There's a lot of complementary strengths here. And, um, and, you know, I'm excited that the focus of where that interface is going to be happens to be um, this particular area that I'm excited about, right? And and um, uh, seeing so many young scientists, including you know many of whom were hired in the last couple of months, who have already clearly drank the Kool Aid, <laughs> um, is pretty is pretty. And we're so able to eloquently articulate said Kool Aid was uh, was exciting as well. So Excellent. yeah. I'll just jump in. I would say, um, for me as an immunologist, having the types of tools and, and technological developments applied to immune cells 
I think it's going to revolutionize, revolutionize how we treat disease. We're going to learn so much about these cells that we've never been able to actually visualize or, or, or learn about. And I think for me, that potential is incredibly exciting and I see it happening. Maybe I'll just bookend mm -hmm. that. So I'm an engineer and I think one thing that I know about this organization is it's coming up, but also that I saw firsthand today is just this infusion of this design prototype test cycle from engineering into discovery and biology, which is something that even you know 15 years ago, I'm not sure I would have seen it fused that tightly. And I think that is a testament to the leadership, but also the ability to identify and take thoughtful risks, but risks that are going to have a big payoff when you meet them. Yeah, and, you know, what's interesting is this is moving so fast. I was thinking they, they didn't drink the Kool-Aid. The, these young scientists are making new Kool-Aid already, and we will have flavors. to drink it, right? <laughs> new flavors of the Kool-Aid. That's how fast this is going. But, you know, we always think when we launch projects together, we think, you know, these would be, if, the, if only these would happen, a, B, or C, this would be a success, right? So we, uh, new technologies, as much or even more than new questions sometimes, change the way we see biology, change our understanding. So what would be one thing if you'd have to pinpoint, you know, one win 10, 15 years from now? It can be simple, can be technological, can be, uh, what, what would you all say? Okay, I'll start this time. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. So I just came out and admitted that I'm an engineer, and I think engineers sometimes aren't really thought of as people person. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing that when I look 15 years from now that I, I was hoping would be a legacy, but I know will be a legacy, I don't need to hope, is the this connectivity between these just world-class premier researchers who know why they get up every day they know why they go into work every day um, and it's something that started here because of the, the closeness of the of the different disciplines working together and towards such an important mission i'll go next because we do reverse order so one of the things that i'm really excited to see is the recorder mouse um, you know a mouse in which we can record what these cells are seeing and more importantly for me is watching the distribution of that mouse to, to other people who could then use it, you know, in, in developmental biology and neuroscience in whatever they want to use it in and, and the ability based on this model to do that, I think is going to be really exciting. No, just, no, I'm going to say the same answer. Like, uh, so, so I, I think that's exactly what Marian said is ex exactly right. And you can imagine a world in which, I mean, why would you use, a standard mouse train if you can use a mouse that records all these things right and you could see it being ubiquitous right um I, i've you know I, I remember like just if i think about the start of my career I, I sort of because you had never seen it yourself you don't really have the ability to um maybe to grasp how quickly technologies can flip um the landscape right and now um you know, over the last 20 years, I've seen that a few times, right? Some, some things we've been involved with, some things we haven't been involved with, but you see it, you know, you see it with next-gen sequencing, you see it with CRISPR, you see it with other areas, and you can kind of really just turn the table, right? So um, uh, unqualified success is flipping the table over, so to speak, right, um, in some time frame. So. See you. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be excited about what we learned from the mice, um, and in particular this question of lineage histories of cells, which is the story of their lives um, and how they change state and identity over time through multiple cell divisions, the daughter cells and daughters of there, um, and how that history of what they, uh, how they came to be relates to their current state. And Jay's written a really fun article about differences between atlas and a lineage history, and we're going to get to the bottom of that in the next decade and i can't wait to see how we resolve all that because it's going to really fundamentally change our understanding of cells and multicellular organisms yeah much like you know a movie where you saw snapshots or the trailer i mean it would be great if we'd have at least one example in 10 years of something we thought we understood well like 
a mutation that derails development or leads to cancer, but then that when you see the whole movie, it's actually a different story and the culprits are different and <laughs> the people trying to <laughs> save things are different, right? So um, that's, that could be a great, a great outcome, right? Now we have here a lot of folks, uh, sorry for the ones at home that you can't pose questions, but we have uh, time, a few minutes for questions here. There's a handheld mic. So please, when you pose your question, use the microphone so uh, uh, people on the live stream can, can hear. I think it's on. You just need to yell a bit. I'll, I'll yell. Okay. I will not yell. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Devin with TechCrunch. Um, as I, I talked about before, uh, Allen Institute, CZI, UW, these are all very large and complicated uh, organizations. And uh, right now your, your interests are all aligned. This is all wonderful science and stuff, but how do you not get in each other's way? The administration is so often the, you know, the bitter enemy of progress and science. And uh, so how do you, how do you avoid that with, you know, multiple organizations, multiple leaders, multiple sources of funding? Um, how can you make sure that the science gets done? So I can maybe take a first cut at that. Um, you know, at CZI, we've, um, you know, made that part of our ethos, trying to bring together great institutions in the service of solving a big problem. Um, and uh, I've had a little practice doing that over time. And it comes down to good planning ahead of time and really uh, trying to understand what you're trying to do, getting the rules, the road in place, and uh, just really getting a clear understanding of that. And, you know, we've had just great leadership on that. I mean, Mark Blandro, Mark Kim sitting right there. We're part of the team that pulled it off here um, from our side, working with uh, Hutch and Allen to try to create those boundary conditions so that everyone knows what their role is. And they just go do great science and focus on that. Everything else we can sort it out. So the part that funds is separated from the part that does the science. And, and uh, there's a joint oversight board that helps. But adding to the rules of engagement, it's also common principles or understanding. It wouldn't work necessarily with every organization, right? So uh, CZI already had an independent commitment to open science, to team science. Uh, so it's, it's a natural extension. Now, this is too big to do alone. And we have to put the incentive structures, the right incentive structures in place. If the incentive structures are wrong, obviously we all will try to, you know, we're primates after all. Um, but if the incentive structures are right, this is not a competition. I mean, we're competing against ourselves to the top of the summit. Things are changing quickly in terms of chronic disease, climate change, impact in life. This type of technology, I mean, if you think about it as an AI moment, but for biology, all hands on deck is what we need. So it's too big to go alone um, from our perspective. So we feel very fortunate. And, and there's much more we're not speaking here, but the teams on all institutions, there's, you know, teams at UW, teams at CZI, teams at Allen that are not part of the Seattle for synthetic biology that will help in data analysis, in dissemination of things, in applications to the clinic. So yes, there could be uh, negative consequences. It's an experiment. But uh, uh, I would just say, for example, in the human uh, brain atlas and the, uh, the mammalian cell atlas that was just published, there are probably 55 institutions collaborating with these with the Allen. So it's these things are too big to go at it alone. Let's add, add a little more. So, I mean, I, like, I could imagine if Allen and CZI had fundamentally different philosophies around science or how they fund science or execute science, it could be 
it would have already been a problem, I guess, at some level, right? Um, but you know, these aren't new. Um, they aren't new to me, at least. Like, so I've I've been funded externally, like as an external investigator by the Allen for um, many, probably a decade now, or something like this, and and served as an advisor to Cell Science for some years, and and um, from a cultural perspective in terms of ethos and commitment to open science and and commitment to impact and all of these things, I think the organizations are very aligned. Um, and I think that makes it a lot easier in terms of not only having gotten to this point, but also the road ahead, right? Once the honeymoon's over, maybe this is the end of the yeah. honeymoon, I don't know. But. <laughs> I just to add one more thing, I think people are so excited about this. I think there's a general goodwill about this that maybe will die out, but We've already gotten things up and running in ways that I can't imagine, you know, multiple institutions being able to do. So I think there's, there is an urge to get this thing going and together and hopefully it'll stay. One more question, maybe. Okay, yeah. good. So thank you all. Thank you to the four of you for this fireside chat. This is a very exciting moment. I hope we can be here in five, 10 years recounting what happened. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for those at home and uh, let's go back to work. <laughs> <laughs>